You gotta get up. Why did me wake up and make a move? Oh. Cause the world will never see you until you do. They no really care, see they do you. Oh. So make you show them, baby. Oh yeah, show them the real you. Oh yeah, show them what till you get. No, 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 don't let them say what to not I want you strong, oh. You can't break, no. You want more than one thousand reasons why. You no need to perfect, baby. Cause nobody perfect, darling. No, 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 there's nobody in the world. Where be like you? Hello, cool and sinity and laugh. Everybody running for us, not every day we they struggle. But this what you know you must do us so just now that you're not alone. I'll bend in on it for you to the form and only your trial. You see, it's okay to ask for help. People go find you, but them not define you. Okay, hello and welcome to the Touch a Cell Show. I'm sure some of you are wondering, Touch a Cell Show on a Monday, but this week we are celebrating or commemorating the World Sickle Cell Day, which is June 19th of every uh, year. And um, we decided that we're going to be running a special series to commemorate this special day in the lives of people with sickle cell and just sickle cell in general. And today we're going to be talking about a very interesting topic, something that we've been going on about, and that is newborn screening. Um, it's very interesting to note that in countries like Ghana, that there's newborn screening policies and they have newborn screening. But how far has Nigeria gotten to that fact of newborn screening? Does Nigeria really need news girl screening? This and more we'll be talking to. And I'll be bringing on my guests on the show and then I will introduce them. Hello, Dr. Adewonyi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> How are How you? <laughs> so Dr. Adewonyi. Yeah, I'm very good. <laughs> very well, thank you. Dr. Adewonyi, for those of us who know, he's a, he's a hematologist uh, and um, also of course a medical doctor so we'll be talking to him about work issues so we'll be talking to I hope my, my network is steady the way it's good to go all right so we'll be talking about newborn screening and the first question I'll be asking you is what really is newborn screening uh, because we talk about it a lot. And I remember as far back as when I started SAMI, it was one of the issues we always talked about. So what is newborn screening? Yeah, yeah. So thank you very much. Um, so I, I think the good oh, way to start is to... Right, is to look at um, the terms involved. Um, so there are two terms in there. You have newborn mm -hmm. 
which means a neonate or a child that is newly born. Um, technically, we say a newborn is um, a baby that is less than 28 days of life. Um, and then the other part is screening. You know, to screen means to detect. So we are looking at detecting a particular disease entity in a newborn. So, I mean, mm -hmm. that's just simply what it means. So in this wise, we're talking about, you know, newborn screening in sickle cell disease. Okay, so what's what what does it, it take? What does it consist of? Uh, uh, why 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 do people talk about it? What, what's different between in fact? What's different between prenatal? Because when it comes to sickle cell, you have prenatal and you have newborn screen. What's the difference? Right. Yeah. So um, prenatal has to do with you know natal means birth. You know, so childbirth has mm. to do with natal. You know, so something before birth is prenatal. So an attempt okay. to diagnose sickle cell disease before birth is prenatal diagnosis. So as compared to newborn diagnosis in which the child has been born and then you are trying to mm -hmm. detect what the hemoglobin type of the child is after birth. Okay, all right. Okay, so that's the difference. Well, so what are the tests? What are the disorders, should I say? that newborn screening, what are the benefits that newborn screening have when, when we, we, we use it on, on, on ch children that are born? Is it just restricted to sickle cell or there are other advantages? Right, so, well, um, like, um, I think I should first say that um, um, newborn screening is actually a generic term, you know, in okay. the sense of in some countries you have a newborn screening program. So there is a program based on a government policy to screen mm -hmm. for prevalent diseases in that particular population. So, for instance, in the mm -hmm. US, every child that is born would be screened for certain conditions conditions like 60 fibrosis, conditions mm -hmm. like um, PKU you know, for the American, um, Afro-Americans, conditions like sickle cell. So there is a total package based on your race that you will be exposed to in order to diagnose early and to start management early. So, um, so that, that's what, you know, the, the package entails. It's not specifically something that is limited to a particular disease state. It's something that is usually formulated based on prevalent conditions within a particular um, nation or country. Okay. All right. So in other words, they, you have different um, things that you can use um, newborn screening for. So why is it, um, should I say that what, what impact do you think it, it has on, on the country having it as, as a, a regular medical, uh, should I call it text or practice or whatever? Right. So the impact is actually unquantifiable. And if we had such a program in Nigeria, I mean, we would have got, gone far, you know, much more better with, you know, control and management of um, of um, different prevalent disease conditions. Number one is that when you have diagnosis at mm. neonatal life, that's as a newborn, so you have the benefit of early diagnosis, and that sort of gives an edge in terms of, of care. So you can optimize care right from birth. You don't have to wait until you start having symptoms and complications of a particular disease entity before you begin to suspect and then you begin to manage those particular entities on complications. So if you make a diagnosis early, even before arrival of complications or manifestations of the disease, you can have this preemptive knowledge and you can begin to have optimal care plan, you know, for such, you know, disease entity. So that's about the, the large benefit of, of, um, of um, newborn screening. You know, so I think I should also speak to the fact that in public health, um, there are different levels of disease control. Um, mm. We typically will talk about the primary control, the secondary control, and the tertiary control. So essentially, primary control has to do with primary. It has to do with preventing it, you know, from the word go. You know, so for instance, um, something like prenatal diagnosis and in countries where it's allowed selective abortion would be a primary intervention in terms of 
control of a particular disease of sickle cell disease. Now, a second level of control would be something like, okay, you make an early diagnosis in this instance, something like newborn screening, and then you optimize mm -hmm. care. So um, early diagnosis with optimal care, that is second level of control. And then a tertiary level of control will include something like you have, you already have the disease, you know, it's manifesting, and then there are complications, and then you try to manage those complications, and that is tertiary level of of control in disease um, management. Okay, so when, when it comes to, when you say early diagnosis, how early is, uh, or should a child uh, be screened? Well, it, it depends on the protocol. Okay. Right. So, uh, I was trying to turn on the light. Well, All right. the light. So I think it depends on, right, yeah. <laughs> So I think essentially, I saw that it's getting dark. So I think essentially mm -hmm. it depends on, it depends on um, the, the protocol, you know. So what you have in practice actually is that you have um, different nations with their policies, and then you also mm -hmm. have institutional protocols. So for instance, an institution like LUT could have its own protocol for newborn screening, you know. So the important thing is that that testing has to be done within that window period called neonatal life, called newborn. And that is be beginning from day zero or the first day of life to the 28th day of life. You know, so the sample has to be collected, you know, and there are different kinds of samples that, that could be collected. So the sample is collected and then such samples are subjected to a particular test, you know, in terms of the screening, you know, the practical, the technical aspects of the screening itself. And then you have the results and then you can have the follow-up um, management. Okay, so um, let's go back to its benefits to people with uh, sick or a child with, um, born with sickle cell. Now, people say, oh, what difference does it make when you have, um, when you do new, newborn screening, that the child is already born, it has a sickle cell. So, um, so what, what impact would you do think it, it will have on the life of somebody born with sickle cell when they do the newborn screening compared to those who don't, they don't have, to have it at all? Well, it, it would have a lot of benefits. I think I should start by mentioning the fact that um, the screenings will not just be done. So the screenings will be done and then data will be captured. So you have, you know, registries where this data is captured, you know, so you have data on the prevalence and incidence of a particular disease that will help for healthcare planning. It will help to mm -hmm. build, you know, some surveillance, you know, care and all that for persons affected. The other good thing is that it also helps the caregivers, the parents and the practitioners. It helps to be mentally and emotionally ready, you know, for, for the care of such, you know, affected persons. So, for instance, a mother and a father that knows that, well, this child, you know, you know has a particular genotype that would make him take ill and all that. So that mentally puts them like, look, we need to get ready for this because, you know, so that in itself is a leverage in terms of, you know, optimizing care and all that. And then the other good part is that if you know early, you can also route, you know, care properly. I mean, if you look at the average age at which, you know, for instance, sickle cell disease is being diagnosed in Nigeria is still far, you know, into the teens. I mean, age yeah. seven, age nine, some people do not even know they have sickle cell on the Yes. Right, before they have an objective diagnosis. But if this is yeah. done in the first 28 days of life, you know, so you know, you know, and then you can now begin to assess care, you know, from dedicated, you know, centers, you know, for sickle care and all that. So that those are some benefits, you know, that I think are, you know, attributable to, to doing this testing at that, at that early stage of life. Okay, so um, if it's so important, um, does it really exist in Nigeria? Because I've not, I've not really seen it being emphasized. And if if not, why not? Well, um, this is um, something that you know is quite bigger than this discussion, you know. And I should say that from you know, yeah, <laughs> you know, from practice around. For instance, there are some hospitals I've worked with and they have their policies. Mm. You know, I do not want to mention names so that it doesn't look like I'm marketing, but there are top-notch, you know, um, pediatric centers in Lagos, particularly in VI, that have 
an institutional policy and protocol for newborn screening. You know, and I also know they have that partnership with some dedicated, you know, diagnostic facilities where they send the samples to. So for every child that is born in those centers, the samples are collected before the moms go home with the kids and then they are analyzed and then the mom comes back during the postnatal visit and then they discuss the results, you know, and that includes stuff like sickle cell disease, you know. So, but as a nation, I do know that we do not have a functional policy. You know, certain things can be on paper, but in terms of, you know, functionality, these are not functional. I know at the time there were dedicated centers by the federal government that were supposed to handle this uh, newborn screening program. You know, I think mm -hmm. there were about six centers around Nigeria in each of the geopolitical zones. And in actual fact, some of them were equipped, you know, with very good technologies, equipment that could do the screening with, you know, with field papers and all that. But somehow, somehow, these projects never really, you know, saw the light of day. You know, so there had been some attempts, you know, to get this thing running, but somehow, I mean, we've not gotten it correctly. So as a nation, we do not have a functional, you know, newborn screening program. I also know that some states have tried in the past. I know specifically or your state had put up a program before now, you know, but that was years back. I'm not sure that program is still running, you know, so sustainability might be an issue. You know, so I think these are, I mean, that's why I said this is something beyond this, you know, what we can discuss on this platform or what we can make, you know, so, but it's good to have a feel of what has happened before, have a feel of what needs to be done, and then we can close mm. that gap. And do you, do you think it's because of the expense? Is it is it very, a very expensive thing to uh, run? Because you, I know you said that you didn't want to mention hospitals, although I would have mentioned them myself because people need to know where these things <laughs> <laughs> right 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 you know, so, <laughs> uh is it that it's expensive if it's if it's not can somebody readily say okay i want to go and do i i'm going, i'm expecting a child and i want to do newborn screening uh it, it, it's something that is possible because i know um i read also somewhere that newborn screening can be used to even test for blindness and and stuff like that so um, is it something that people can do? Is it it's so expensive that that's why it's not available everywhere? Well, I I think um, if you ask me again, I think cost is relative and it depends on what you want mm -hmm. to get out of it. Um, if you look at the average cost of getting an hemoglobin check, um, it ranges from about maybe about a thousand to about um, six, seven thousand. Mm -hmm in no. the market you know so and that's about what a newborn screening will cost depending on the no. method so there are different methods to get this done in terms of laboratory no. analysis now you know so but on the average that's what it's going to cost you know so i think for an average hana in lagos and i see that as a priority this is not particularly beyond reach you know in terms of government intervention i think this is practicable and I think it's sustainable. I think what we lack is the political will to get this done. I think we have probably not had that strength of, you know, of um, uh, will on the part of leadership to get this done. Um, mm. um, because we have to look at the overall benefit. You know, it's not just the cost of, you know, we have to look at the, the benefit to us. I mean, I'm looking at the cost effectiveness or the cost benefit of having such a program in place, you know. So I think as a nation, this is something not beyond us. It's something that we can implement and get done if we choose to. Uh, so in such a case, how can private sector be involved? Because I know sometimes government say they have so many things they are doing and all that. But is this something that private sector can be involved that would be able to make this thing work? Right. So, um, yes, I, I would, I would, you know, agree to that, um, to that um, line of thought. Private sector has a lot of role to play, and that is not far-fetched. Um, as, as much as I understand currently, as much as 60-70% of healthcare delivery in Nigeria is still from the private sector, you know, mm. so there's still so much room for the private sector, you know, engagement. Um, so the private sector engagement would include, you know, things like, you know, bringing more capacity in this regard. I can tell you as a fact that even in this Lagos, there are a number of diagnostic facilities that are able to offer newborn screening. 
you know, the methodology is much available. So it's a question of fine tuning this and it's a question of having a partnership with, you know, centers where these kids are being born, either in the private mm. sector or in the public sector and having the logistics of sample collection and sample transport and all that, you know, perfected and then results are generated, you know. So this is, like I said before, there is a facility I know in Lagos where they have, as a policy, they have that running and they have a partnership with another private diagnostic firm. And then this is an ongoing program. So every child that is born in that hospital is subjected to newborn screening and the mothers have the results. It's part of the package, you know. So there's a lot of room for private sector involvement, really. Okay. Uh, and it, all, it also can be a private, uh, is it PPP, private uh, public partnership at the same time? Right, exactly. So it can be private public partnership, you know, to drive this. I think that that works in a, in a large sense. That, that can be accommodated to drive this, you know. So, so you tend to notice that you have the, more of the patient population in the public sector, but um, the private sector has more of the capacity in terms of manpower in terms of the competence in terms of the equipment you know so they can actually match these two you know um, these two um, positives and use it to create a larger impact okay what, what would you say with to people because there's this tendency to, to say that okay no the the what we should do is um preventive we should go all out preventive forget the newborn screening matter let's just stop people from marrying let's let's like even the new bill that is coming up let's 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 put some um punitive uh things to it and all that what would you say uh to issues like that when it comes to okay people advocating for newborn screening right well you know like i said you know prevention you know has multiple prongs so there are different approaches to to prevention um so um one of it is legislation so so i mentioned three levels of disease prevention yeah. um there is another level that i didn't want to delve into and that's what we call the primordial prevention you know and okay. primordial has so much to do with um, public health education you know, so we are trying to prevent sickle bats. So from the word go, you sensitize people about their hemoglobin test or about their hemoglobin phenotypes. I, I like to call it phenotype because it's actually a phenotype test. We actually not doing... <laughs> right, right. You know, I, I, I try to, you know, you know, but for the sake of this, let's just say genotype. You know, that's what everybody tends to, you know, flow along with. You know, so... So there's so much, you know, that can be done in terms of, you know, prevention. There are so much, you know, so much measures. So one of it is public health education. So if you sensitize people and they know that, look, the risk is there. If you have AS and AS coming together, the risk of SS is there. You know, so people can have a behavioral mm -hmm. change and choose that, look, I choose not to do this. You know, so that's a primordial because you're even preventing it at that level, at that primordial level. You know, one of those other measures is the one we're talking about, legislation. You know, and the problem has to do with, you know, where is the balance of human rights in this? You know, so how do you yeah. balance it? You know, yeah. you know, we, we have a right to social interactions. We have a right to connections. We have a right, you know, to, I mean, we have freedom of expression. We have freedom of friendship and all that, you know. So why would there be any legislation that will forbid me from marrying someone that I choose to marry irrespective of, you know? So that mm -hmm. is a highly debatable area. I would rather come mm -hmm. from the angle of public health education and enlightenment and make, make people make choices, you know. So, but, you know, in other nations too, that is not going to fly. The issue of legislation against, you know, against um, career marriages, they call it, that is not going to mm -hmm. fly because there are other options for these couples. You know, you can choose that, you know, they are, I mean, career marriages occur and then they can choose to have their prenatal diagnosis, you know, and then mm -hmm. in some nations you have your option of selective abortion you know so they keep expunging you know until they have the right one or some people can even choose to do some sort of pre-implantation diagnosis or, or choose to do some sort of um, um even artificial measures like in vitro fertilization and carefully select which sperm cell to marry to which egg cell you know no. that will not produce you know an ss phenotype you know so there are several other options so the the legislation option is actually 
um, going to be a tough one. It's going to be a challenging one. And <laughs> I don't mm. see that flying to a large extent, you know, even <laughs> in, a, in a nation oh. like us. I don't see it flying. <laughs> <laughs> no, anything can fly. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let, let me take, I have a question here. So let me take, uh, yeah. A question from Abisola. Yes. She says, why is finding out that SS testing so problematic in Nigeria? Also, why is the government not making testing newborn screening mandatory? Well, I don't know. I think <laughs> let me let me leave you to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. So I, I actually I, I think if I understand the questions very well, so the first question has to do with why is you know, testing for sickle cell disease problematic. Yes. And then the second question is why is the government ha having challenges establishing a newborn program for sickle cell screening? Yes. Right. You know, so in terms of um, testing being problematic, um, I think it still boils down to the fact that um, we have not made the right choices. Um, mm. And the, the leadership, you know, in the respective healthcare spaces, I think we have not pushed enough. So we need to do more advocacy to ensure that these things work more. So um, there are a lot of problems around it, really. The first one is having access to this test. So the question is, someone living in a village in Ogun State, does the person even have access to checking for exactly. sickle cell disease? I doubt yeah. it. You know, exactly. so the access yeah. is not equitable. Mm -hmm. Right. And then you have, you know, then the other even, right. giving false, false results. Right. So that's another challenge. And that boils to the type of techniques being used in getting some of these testings done. You know, so there are different types of methodologies that we can engage in doing the testings. You know, I don't think I want to bore us with all the technicalities but the common one is what we call zone electrophoresis which uses mm -hmm. the electrophoretic chamber you know yeah. where you use the cellulose acetate paper and all that you know so that has a couple of you know challenges number one is cumbersome number two you have to have very good controls and the problem is that many of these laboratories that do these testings don't even have control and like we mm -hmm. say in medicine or in science generally Every experiment without control is invalid. And so you see many labs running tests without controls. And so there is really no way you can validate some of the results they are generating. And that's why they will issue out a result and they will say someone that is truly SS, they might say the person is AA or AS, or someone that is AS, they say the person is AA. Because in the mm. controls they use for the testing, they do not even have what it takes to make a control. So we've seen that, you know, a number of times. You know, so the other methodologies that are more reliable, obviously, are more expensive. So we talk about hemoglobin fractionation or the high performance liquid chromatography. That is more expensive because now we have a full automation, no longer a manual process. You have a machine, you know, that does the entire, you know, testing process automation. All you need to do is to feed in the sample and it's going to do the fractionation. So you have your hemoglobin F is, you know, 10%. You have the hemoglobin S fraction. You have it at 70%. You have A as whatever fraction and all that. You know, so that is a more robust technology, but that obviously is more expensive, you know. Yeah. Than, so there are a lot of problems that surround, that surround the testing or the diagnosis generally. You know, there are also issues of manpower. We've talked about issue of distribution of resources. You know, there are also issues of affordability. You know, mm -hmm. what, you know, what is affordable to person A might not be affordable to person B. Some persons yeah. would not think twice. They can easily pay 10,000 Naira for an hemoglobin check. Some other persons, that 10,000 Naira is probably what they survive on to feed for two weeks. Exactly. You know, so that is not going to be a priority to them. You know, so, so these are some of the issues surrounding that. You know, so in terms of why the, the government has not gotten it right, I think we should do more advocacy, you know, with more programs like this, with talking to healthcare leaders, you know, with more private public sector involvement. I think we can get more of this facility, of this infrastructure on board. We can get more of these testings available. 
and we can actually you know scale up and culminate to a point in which we have a national newborn screening program for sickle cell you know mm. and that will be you know a huge success truly yes it will definitely uh, because uh, you know the i have this belief that if we can push to get people to do certain things it's possible uh, and there are a lot of ways that we can al always manage the issue of sickle cell in nigeria you know, I, I keep hearing, okay, we have the highest body and we have the highest body. But when you look at the, like when I was even reading the bill, for instance, I was like, okay, first of all, how many people go to hospital to even give birth, let alone to even say they want to go and take their genotype? You know, most most people use them, right. um, bath, bath mothers or I don't midwives, those local midwives, you know. Traditional <laughs> bath attendants. <laughs> exactly. So people use, I, right. how are you to talk to those ones? You know, I, 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 I believe that we should even make use of these traditional bath attenders by even training them into educating people about such issues. But um, it takes uh, a whole involvement of different stakeholders. Um, so that, that brings me to advocacy. How would you suggest um, NGOs like us and other stakeholders can advocate for such changes in government policy? Right. So, um, I am, well, advocacy um, as a tool um, mm. would have to, you know, involve a lot of um, um, channels. Um, so, um, a number of channels could be engaged. Number one is that um, um, some politicking might be involved in which we might have to use people that are close to the corridors of power. You know, mm. so people that are close to, you know, the the ASORO, people close to the ministries of health, people close to the different, you know, government powerhouses, you know, so we can use those steps, you know, to, to, to get things done. The other thing is that we can keep, you know, um, creating enlightenment programs and sensitizing the public on the need, you know, we have come of age and this needs, you know, to be done as, I mean, this is more like, you know, uh, should I say a call to action? We need to get this done in order to save our future, in order to increase our health indices, in order to decrease burden, you know, of persons affected and all that, and, and to increase care, you know. So we need to use different sort of media, you know, online media, traditional media, and all that mm. to speak, you know, more to people that are influencers. You know, this can also be done through publications, you know, there can be position papers, you know, from different stakeholders. You know, when I mean stakeholders, I'm talking about physician groups that are involved in um, care. I'm talking about NGOs writing, you know, as a formidable, you know, team, you know, to, to the government, you know, and we can also, also engage even before, beyond the, the corridors of Nigeria. We can, you know, have more interface with um, international groups. I know there are donor agencies out there that are even willing to supply equipment that are willing, you know, to work with um, local um, resources or local, um, should I say, NGOs or local providers to execute or to implement some of these projects. You know, so we need to tap into a whole lot of this. And, and right from the word go, there has to be a factor of resilience. Uh, we should set our goals correctly and we should keep going for it until we get it right. You know, more often than not, we tend to give up or we are distracted and all that. That's why we don't see this coming, you know, to place. You know, so if we keep, you know, hitting at it and keep advocating, speaking to the corridors of power and doing more and doing more and doing more, I think one day we'll wake up and realize that we've actually achieved a lot through advocacy. Which brings me to what uh, Mr. Lai says, is the Nigerian government hearing us. We don't even make building wheelchairs. Build, we don't even make building wheelchair accessible for people. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It, it, it is a challenge, but like you said, you just have to keep knocking at the door, knocking at the door, and um, uh, hopefully they could. But um, I'm going back to the private sector. I know that because even when, when we're doing NGO stuff, I noticed that uh, private sectors are more focused on issues Despite we have a lot of sickle cell in Nigeria and it's the highest in the world, private sectors more, lean more towards malaria, HIV, you know, all the, the what I call the regulars. 
<laughs> so how, right. how, how malaria hiv tuberculosis those are the three prominent programs that you know so how do we tune private sector to be able to realize that this is an issue and this is an issue that is really in nigeria you know how how how, how do we get them to be more involved in in such cases is it that we have need to talk more or knock on doors more or find it attractive for them to 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 give csr to or something <laughs> right 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 you know what i realized you know is that you know thinking about it you realize that um the donor agencies to have their interest mm. so um so you realize the likes of funding programs like um pepfa like uh, usaid like um i mean there are a couple of them they seem to have yeah. had their you know their background interest and i think yeah. it's a bit polarized because they are more they are more interested in infectious diseases and they are yes. more interested in things that, that because of globalization could affect them more readily you know mm -hmm. so they are more affected in hiv they are more interested in in, in tuberculosis because they will not want someone with tuberculosis to come into the us or to come into the uk and all that so i mean i think they have you know so some of those interests seems to so i think the way to do it is actually to put ourselves in their, their face and you know increase their interest whatever that means you know however we can get that done is to actually you know increase their interest in non-communicable diseases you know mm -hmm. you know so you realize much of the focus are on communicable diseases malaria hiv these are communicable entities mm -hmm. you know um tuberculosis communicable but non-communicable diseases like sickle cell like cancer we need to get these things more into their face mm -hmm. you know and that we can do you know, from the academic world, there can be more of, you know, gr grant making activities to try and get grants to support projects like this. You know, from NGO perspective, we can try and do more grant making too, to try and get sponsorships for projects like this. And then we can do more and more, you know, you know, in terms of trying to, you know, some of them will have their predetermined criteria in, in terms of funding mm -hmm. for specific projects. You know, but I do think that we can actually change the narrative by making this a priority, you know, through advocacy and through talking more and talking more and you know and engaging them through whatever activity and through whatever for her. even through the embassies the u.s embassies and different embassies they have programs from time to time you know so we can get more in the affairs and get them to see a need for this you know we can you know get to share insightful stories that really make them feel you know or understand the burden of this condition to us you know so that they can fund more you know, they can, you know, divert more funding in this direction. It's not only cancer that is killing. It's not only malaria that is killing. It's not only tuberculosis. Exactly. It's not only HIV. We have, you know, issues, you know, like um, sickle cell disease to contend with as well. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I don't know if we have any more questions. and But if we don't, I'll let you go. I know it's late. And <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah thank right, you so right. much so to, to warriors out there um you know uh especially during this period sorry i didn't get a question could you say that again do you have any last words to okay somebody's asking a question All right. Right. Someone... right yeah so okay someone say, do we go radical with that campaign yes we need to go radical but not um what's the word i'm looking for we shouldn't be not uh, not, not provocative or not <laughs> thank um, you that's what not, i'm looking for not 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 being be offensive. offensive exactly <laughs> right. exactly right yeah before, before she, <laughs> she she said that we're, i was we're asking, not doing black lives matter we are not doing black lives matter <laughs> in the u.s <laughs> <laughs> oh dear yeah well no but we, we know we, we should try it because we, it, it won't even work here <laughs> we have to use but we be, be very um intentional about how we're going to do it yes all right so, so what i was saying that any last word to warriors out there and even families that have children with sickle cell Right. So my last word would be that we need to hone our health. 
Um, and that I will express in a few words. Um, we tried to do a survey and we realized that people that have chronic conditions, they come to the hospital, they don't even know their diagnosis, some of them, especially the ones that are not educated. They do mm. not even know which medications they are taking. So they just have a refill of drugs and they do mm. not even know. So they know close to nothing about what their disease is and what their care is. So mm. that looks like, you know, they are not engaged and involved, you know. So when I say hone your health, you need to know. You know, one of the things I do when I have my clients is to, you know, I do a lot of education. You know, I even give assignments, you know, about, you know, and the idea is to get them to know more about, you know, because when you hone something, when you have some sort of ownership about something, you do much better than when it's more like a an authoritarian thing, you know, the doctors just dump it on you and you have no clue and all that. So I'll just say to us one again, we need to hone our health. We, we need to be involved in honing our health. You need to know why you take this medication. You need to know what you need to do to prevent certain things, you know, so that way you hone your health and you do better. All right. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, it's been an enlightening program um, with you and uh, hopefully you will be able to come again. <laughs> Not so rushed this time. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So right. Have Thanks a, a lot for having me. Thank you again. And to those of us who joined, thank you for sharing uh, in this conversation. And let's continue the conversation online. What can we do to create advocacy? What can we do to let everybody hear our, our, our voice? Because it's very important, most especially in this period of World Sickle Cell Day. Thank you and have a lovely day. Thank you, bye.